So we have seen how to use breadth first and depth first search to explore whether there is a path from a source to a target vertex. But one can do a lot more with these two procedures. So recall that a graph is a set of vertices and a set of edges which are connections between the vertices and these may be directed or undirected. Now when we do breadth first search, we do a level by level exploration starting at one vertex. When we do depth first search, each time we go to a new vertex, we switch the exploration to that vertex and whenever we reach a dead end, we back up. And one of the features of depth first search is that we can keep track of the order in which we enter and exit vertices in this recursive procedure. So now let's see how we can use BFS and DFS to find out more about the structure of the underlying graph. So one fundamental property of an undirected graph is whether or not it is connected. Can we go from every vertex to every other vertex? So you can see in these two pictures that the graph on the left is connected because you can go from every vertex to every other vertex. On the other hand, on the right hand side, some vertices cannot be reached from other vertices. For example, one cannot go from 2 to 7 or from 6 to anywhere else. Now when we have an undirected graph which is disconnected, we are also interested in finding out what the connected components are. So we want to group together those vertices which are connected to each other into one unit and find out which of these units are there and how many such units are there and which vertices belong to the same unit. So our first target is to use BFS or DFS to identify connected components. So this is quite easy to do. We start with the node labeled one or any other node. Now we run BFS or DFS from this node. And in this process, we will mark a number of nodes as visited. At this point, if there are any vertices which are not visited by BFS or DFS starting from the first node, this means that they do not belong to the same connected component. So it is easy to show that what is marked visited is equal to the connected component. So the connected component containing the start node. So now we go back and we look at the first node in the list which is not marked visited. And we restart BFS or DFS from that node. So we will get a new connected component consisting of those vertices which are reachable from the first node which was marked unconnected. Now if there are still nodes which are unvisited, we restart from one of those and go on. So what we can do now is we can label each DFS with a different number. So at the end, we can associate with each vertex the number of the component in which it was discovered. So let's look at an example of this. So supposing we have this graph, right? we begin by having an extra variable in our BFS, for example, or even DFS called comp to number the components. So we initially set comp to one and maybe we start our DFS or BFS from node one. So in this process, we will visit 1, 2, 5, 9 and 10 and for all of these, we will set component of j equal to comp. Now at this point, we will realize that not all nodes have been visited. Only 5 out of the 12 nodes have been visited. So we go to the smallest node which is not visited, namely 3 and restart. But before we restart, we update comp to 2. Now we start a BFS or a DFS at node 3 and visit everything that we can reach and in this process, we will identify these six nodes as being in component 2. At this point, node 6 is still not marked visited. So we restart a third round of BFS or DFS with comp set to 3 and identify a third component. Now there are no more unvisited nodes, so we can stop. And in the as a result of this repeated application of BFS and DFS, we have identified all the components and also clustered them so that all nodes in the same component are associated with the same component number. Another interesting structural property of a graph is whether or not it has cycles. So an acyclic graph is a graph such as the left in which you cannot start at any node and follow a sequence of edges and come back to the node. On the right, we see a graph with cycles. So for instance, 5, 9 and 10 form cycles. There are also other cycles. There are several cycles, for example, 3, 4, 7, 8 as a whole form a cycle, but there are also smaller cycles within it like 3, 4, 8 and 3, 7, 8 and 7, 8, 11 is also a cycle and so on. So one of the things we can do when we execute BFS is to keep track of those edges which are actually used to mark vertices as visited. Now, if we have an acyclic graph such as the one on the left, 
you can check that every node that is in the graph will actually be used as part of the BFS search. On the other hand, if you run BFS on a graph which has cycles, then you will find that some edges are not used because when you try to explore those edges, you find the target vertex is already visited. For instance, since 10 is already visited as a neighbor of 5, when we start exploring 9, we do not use the edge 9, 10. Likewise, we don't use the edge 4, 8 because it is already visited as a set of neighbors of 3. Remember in breadth first search, we will go to 3 and explore all its one step neighbors. So we will mark directly 4, 8 and 7 as visited. So when we come to 4, we don't need to use the edge 4, 8. When we come to 7, we don't need to use 7, 8 and so on. So there are these edges which are left out. Now it's easy to see that if we have a graph with n vertices and it is connected and it doesn't have cycles, then it will have exactly n minus 1 edges. This kind of a graph is called a tree. So there are many definitions of trees, but trees, a tree is basically a connected acyclic graph. Connected means you can go from everywhere to everywhere. Acyclic means there are no loops and any connected acyclic graph on n vertices will have exactly n minus 1 edges. So in any graph, if we explore BFS, the edges that BFS actually uses will form a tree and this is called a BFS tree. Now what happens about the remaining edges? Well, these are called non-tree edges and what you can check very easily is that any non-tree edge will combine with the tree edges already there to form a cycle. In other words, when we run BFS, if we find that there are some vertices or some edges rather which are not used, in other words, there are any non-tree edges, then this graph will definitely have a cycle. So having a cycle is equivalent to finding a non-tree edge while doing BFS. What is a non-tree edge? It's just an edge where we come to explore i, j and find that j has already been marked visited. So we don't go to i, I don't use i, j in our BFS. So let's do the same thing with DFS and let's compute the pre and post numbers so that we get some practice at this. So we start our DFS at vertex 1 and we mark its counter as 0. So we enter vertex zero, vertex 1 at step 0. So this is the pre number of vertex 0. The first neighbor we explore from 1 is 2. So it has pre, one, pre, neighbor, pre number 1. But 2 has no further successor. So we exit from 2. So it has post number 2. So remember every time we enter we increment a counter. Every time we exit we increment a counter. So we enter and increment ex exit uh, vertex 2 in one step. Come back to 1 and explore its next neighbor which is 5 which we enter at time 3. Then we move to vertex 9 at time 4. Then from 9 we go to 10 at time 5. Now 10 has no further neighbors to explore. So we exit 10 at time 6. 9 has no further neighbors. So we exit 9 at time 7. Come back to 5. Again 5 has no further neighbors. So we exit 5. And then finally we exit 1. So at step 9 we have completed processing 1. Now we move to the first vertex which is not marked, namely 3. And we restart a new DFS from there. So we enter 3 at time 10. From 3 we move to 4 at time 11. From 4 we move to 8 at time 12. From 8 we move to its smallest neighbor unvisited which is 7 at time 13. From 7 we go to 11 at time 14. Now 11 has no new neighbors to explore because both 7 and 8 have been seen. So we exit from 11. 7 has no more neighbors to explore so we exit from 7 and we exit from 8. No, we don't exit from 8. Sorry, from 8 we still have to explore 12. So we enter 12 at step 17. Then we exit from 12 and now 8 is finished. So we exit from 8. Now we come back to 4. 4 obviously has no other vertices. So we come back to 3. And finally we exit from 3 at time 21. At this point 6 is still not marked. So we start a new DFS from 6. So we enter 6 at time 22. But 6 has no neighbors. So we exit 6 at time 23. So this like BFS generates a collection of trees. So when we do DFS on a disconnected graph, each connected component will generate a tree. Now if we look at the edges which we did not explore, these will again be edges which are outside the tree. So we can draw them in a different color. So we have the edge between 5 and 10 which we did not explore because we explored five, the 10 directly from 9 and so on. So once again, just like in BFS, once we have finished DFS, if there are non-tree edges, then we have a cycle.
right? So both BFS and DFS on an undirected graph can reveal a cycle through the presence of a non-tree edge. So the situation with directed graphs is a little more complicated. So let's see what happens when we have cycles in directed graphs. So in a directed graph, we need to follow the edge arrows, arrows along the edges. So for example, 1, 3, 4, 1 is a cycle because we can go around without changing direction. Whereas 1, 6, 2, 1 is not a cycle because on the way back, I have to switch directions from 2 to 1, which I cannot do. So let's do a DFS and see what this can tell us about cycles in this graph. So we begin with vertex 1 as usual. So 1 has pre number 0. Its smallest neighbor is 2. Okay. And the smallest neighbor of 2 is 5. And the smallest neighbor of 5 is 6. And the smallest neighbor of 6 is 7. Now from 7, there are no outgoing edges. So we backtrack to 6. From 6, the only node that we can go to is 2, which we have seen before. So we leave 6. Now we come to 5. 5 still has an outgoing edge which is 8. So we come to 8. Now from 8 we can't do anything so we return from 8 back to 5. Now 5 has nothing left to explore so we leave 5. Likewise we leave 2. Finally we come back to 1. Now at 1 we have explored this left path. So now we cannot, we don't uh, look there, we look in the other direction go to 3. So we explore 3, now 3 will explore 4, but 4 cannot go to 8 or 1 because 1 has already been seen and so is 8, so 4 will exit, so 3 will exit and then 1 will exit. So this happens to be a single connected graph, but it has cycles, right? So now we can first look at these edges, the edges that we have drawn are tree edges as before. Now if we look at the edges that have not been part of the graph, they fall into three groups. So the first type of edge which is not a part of the tree is what we call a forward edge. So a forward edge is an edge which goes from a node to a node below it in the tree. So we have a node from 1 to 6 for example. So this edge okay, is a tree edge. It's, a, it's not a tree edge but it's a forward edge because 1 was above 6 in the graph. Likewise, the node from 5 to 7 right? because we actually explored this graph as 5, 6, 7. So 5 to 7 was not used. So these are forward edges. The other category of edges which are there in the graph, which are not in the tree, are backward edges. They go up the tree. So from 6, there is this edge back to 2 which we did not use because 2 had already been explored. Likewise, from 4 back to 1, there was this edge which we did not explore because it was already there. There is another category of edges which are not there in the tree but which are there in the graph. And these are edges such as from 6 back to 2. So this was an edge from a later vertex to an earlier vertex or from 4 back to 1. So these are what are called back edges. So a back edge is an edge in the graph which in the DFS tree goes from a lower vertex to a higher vertex. And finally there are some edges which are neither going forward nor backwards but sideways. So these are edges like 8 to 5, okay, sorry uh, 8 to 7 and from 4 to 8. So these cross, so 4 is not below 8 nor is 8 below 4, 7 is not below 8 because they are both below 5 and so on. So these we call cross edges. Now it's easy to argue that a cross edge will only go from right to left. In other words, it will only go from a higher number to a lower number. Because if we wanted to draw an edge like this for instance, then this would mean that there was an edge from 2 to 4, so we would explore 4 through 2 rather than wait and go back to 1 and explore it. Right? So we cannot have cross edges which go from lower numbers to higher numbers. It must go from higher numbers to lower numbers. So now we have not one but three types of non-tree edges. Unlike the directed case when we had a clear distinction between tree edges and non-tree edges, here we have three types of non-tree edges. Now which ones of these correspond to cycles? So if I look at this one tree edge, okay, so this one tree edge, sorry this uh, one six edge, so this 1, 6 edge doesn't actually create a cycle because we already saw that this is not a cycle. Okay? So in order for it to complete a cycle, it must be the case that there is a path including this edge which forms a directed cycle. 
Now it's easy to see that the only situation where this will actually happen is there is a back edge. Because if there is a back edge, we know that there is a path coming from 2 down to 6 and then by following the back edge, this forms a direct cycle. Okay, likewise, we know that there is a path coming from 1 down to 4 and by following this back edge, we follow a direct cycle. On the other hand, if we look at the other types of edges for instance, then we have this path here, but this is parallel to the other path here. Right? So together these are both two different ways of going from 1 to 6, but they are not a cycle. Okay? And the same way we can see that if we have a, a cross edge like this, then we have some path coming from here and some path going from there. But again they are just two different ways of reaching 7 from 5 and they are not really a cycle. Okay? So it turns out by a little analysis that only back edges form cycles and this is actually something that you can prove. We will not prove it formally but it's argued the way we did just now that a directed graph has a cycle if and only PFS really reveals a back edge. Now it turns out that these pre and post numberings are very useful to help us classify the types of edges that are there in the graph. So for both tree and forward edges, so you will notice that if you go back to this numbering, okay, that these things form an interval that you can think of this as from 0 to 15, from step 0 to 15 I was exploring 1, from step 11 to 14 I was exploring 3, from step 2 to 9 I was exploring 5 and so on. So if you look at the pre and the post number, it says I started exploring the number at the pre and I finished exploring at post and everything else that was below happened in between. Right? So for a forward edge, the interval above will be smaller than the bigger than the interval below because I start I went below during this period and I came back before it ended. So for instance, the forward edge from 0, 15 to 3,6. So the interval 3,6 is inside 0, 15. Okay, this is also for, true for tree edges because in the tree edge also, if I'm going forwards, I enter the lower node after I've entered this, so its starting point will be later and its ending point will be earlier. So for both tree edges and forward edges, if I am going from u to v, then the interval with the start node u will contain the other one. So this will be sitting inside this, the pre v post v will be sitting inside pre u post v. Right? So I will have this picture. So this is the interval for u and this is the interval for v. Conversely, it is exactly the opposite for backward edges. I start from a smaller interval and I go to a bigger interval. So the smaller interval will be the starting a point with the edge the bigger interval will be the ending point. So if I look at an edge in my DFS tree and if I look at the pre and post numbers associated with the endpoints, I can determine whether it's a forward or tree edge or a backward edge. And finally, it will turn out that for cross edges, the intervals are disjoint. So we can see here that we have finished processing for seven, uh, vertex 7 before we get to 8. So there is no intersection between the intervals 7, 8 and 4, 5. Likewise, we have finished processing 8 before we went to 4. That's why it's a cross edge. They are on different branches of the tree. So there is no intersection between 7, 8 and 12, 30. Right? So therefore, a directed graph has a cycle if and only if DFS reveals a back edge. And we can classify edges as being forward edges, backward edges or cross edges by just looking at the pre and post numbering of the endpoints of the edge. Now, it's important to identify cycles because if we don't have cycles, we have a very nice class of graphs called directed acyclic graphs. These are useful for modeling dependencies. For instance, if you want to list out a bunch of courses which are being offered and they have prerequisites, then a natural way to model this is using a directed graph where the edges represent prerequisites. For instance, if they have an edge from algebra to calculus, it indicates that algebra is a prerequisite for calculus. We will not have cycles because we cannot have two courses which are prerequisites for each other, otherwise we will not be able to take either course. So we will look at directed acyclic graphs or DAGs soon in a later lecture. What about connectivity in directed graphs? So connectivity in a directed graph is not just a question of having a, these edges between the graphs but having them in the right direction. So we say that two nodes are strongly connected if I can go from i to j by a path and I can come back from i to j to i by a path. Right? So it's not enough to just have edges in some haphazard direction, I must be able to go from i to j and come back from j to i in which case I say they are strongly connected. So it turns out that a directed graph can always be decomposed into what are called strongly connected components. 
A strongly connected component has a property that every pair of nodes in that component is strongly connected. From every node in the component, you can go to every other node in the component and come back. So for instance, if we look at this graph, then the strongly connected components, one is this cycle 1, 3, 4. We can go from 1 to 3 to 4 and come back. So from any node in this cycle, we can come back to any other node. Likewise, 2, 5 and 6 forms a strongly connected component. 7 on its own is a strongly connected component because we can't go anywhere. And 8 also is a strongly connected component because if we leave 8, we can't come back to 8 the way this graph is structured. Okay, So this graph has 4 strongly connected components. Now it turns out that DFS numbering using pre and post numbers can be used to compute strongly connected components. A very elegant algorithm is given in the book by Das Gupta, Papa Dimitro and Vajirani. And if you are interested, you can look it up in that book. So we have seen some concrete examples of what you can compute. There are many other properties that you can compute using uh, BFS and DFS. For instance, there are these things called articulation points. If your graph looks like this, where I have some vertex which is a crucial vertex, if I remove this vertex, this graph falls apart into disconnected components. I can identify such vertices using BFS and DFS, in particular using DFS. Similarly, if I have a situation where I have an edge like this, where if I remove this edge, then the graph gets disconnected, then I can again identify such an edge using DFS. Now these are important because if these graphs represent some kind of communication network or some road network, then these are bottlenecks, these are critical points. If this, if this is an intersection and if there is an accident, no traffic can go from any part on the left to any part on the right. Or if this is a, a network wire, if this cable gets cut, then the network will get cut, disconnected into two components. So these kind of properties can also be computed during BFS and DFS. So it is important to realize therefore that BFS and DFS is not just for connecting to finding out whether vertex S can reach vertex T. You can get a wealth of information and these are linear time algorithms and these are all operations which can be performed during BFS and DFS. So very efficiently you can compute various properties of the graph and use these to uh, exploit these to design more efficient procedures or to identify other things that need to be done.